Today's lesson is from the 35th chapter of Isaiah, beginning with the fourth verse. Say to those who have an ancient heart, an ancient heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For water break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. Here ends the lesson. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. From the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Mark, beginning at the 31st verse. Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be open. And his ears were open. His tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed him. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I would like to invite all of the students that are returning to school and uh, have them come forward for a blessing. And we're going to invite Sunday school teachers, and we're going to invite school teachers, public school, private school, home school, fish school, <laughs> just checking. Come on up. Yeah, uh, yeah, up on your feet. It's okay. Up on your feet. I don't want to blush you all. And uh, I think we know that uh, it's always a, something to celebrate whenever, uh, you know, the kids go off to school again, isn't it? And uh, we continue to ask the Lord's presence and uh, protection over them. We're also grateful for our Sunday school teachers who are going to be helping out this year. And um, we're also um, praying God's blessings and protection over those who teach in universities and uh, uh, the public school and even home school and, and uh, private school. I think it's important. Come on up and just filter in. Come on up. It's, a, it's okay. Come on up. I don't bite too hard. Caitlin, come on up and just filter in. Yeah. I'm going to put a little bit of oil on you and I'm going to pray God's blessings. Okay. So come Holy Spirit, release the power of the kingdom now over our teachers and Sunday school teachers, uh, over our, our students, our kids as they return, um, college age kids uh, as well. We uh, pray your blessing over each of them. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would grant them full protection. As the word says in Psalm 91, Behold, I will plant my angels around you, lest you strike your foot against a stone. But Lord, I pray that they would appoint their days to wisdom, that they would study hard, and that you would open their minds so that they can receive and also 
that you would settle them so they can receive, and grant them a full measure of protection, that whether they're coming or they're going, that your hand of protection is always upon them. Grant them your perfect peace. Grant them anointing. I bless moms and dads as well. So much of the education process <laughs> has to happen. I'll give you a double one because I missed you, okay? And Lord, uh, thank you for the great joy they are. And help them to know that they have a loving, caring congregation here who's right beside them. I pray blessings over them as they get on the bus, as they get off the bus. I pray, Lord, your anointing and protection as they are riding the bus and as they're encountering others on the bus, that their mouths are clean and pure and, Lord, that their hearts are, uh, are clean and pure and continue to be open and receptive to all you have for them. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Have a great year. It's going to be a great year. Baby King. Oh, it's a prayer. Okay. Got it excited. Okay, so Lord, uh, we ask that you would do for us, even as you did for the man in the gospel passage, where you opened his mouth, you opened his ears, and you set his tongue loose, and grant that we would be able to hear your word, and that we would also be able to speak your word plainly and with clarity. In Jesus' name, Amen. B.B. King and you two, Bana, got together to sing a duet called When Love Comes to Town. Who remembers that? We even had a clip of that a few couple years ago, and it's one of my favorite clips. The, the two of them are singing together, and they uh, have a wonderful image of, of Jesus. What happens when Jesus comes to town? And this gospel passage that we hear is so magnificent because he comes to the towns of Decapolis. Decapolis is ten cities. And uh, in his ministry, he sets those who are, uh, he heals the man who is deaf as well as he's mute. He, his tongue is not functioning correctly, so he can't speak. Have you ever heard of being tongue-tied? This uh, is frequent in uh, for newborns. And uh, sometimes that, that happens, but then the surgeon is able to come along and just give a little, a little cut, so that way they can enjoy ice cream cones. And uh, they're able to speak. And I have such a big heart and such appreciation for those who are uh, speech uh, therapists and audiologists. Lynn, you do some of that, right? So, I mean, just a, a huge that you are doing the Lord's work in all you do. And you do it in the public schools. So I'll tell you what, extra big points for that. So it was very important, but there's something about the heart and the love of Jesus that when Jesus comes, things are never the same in a good way. And uh, I let, you know I love to talk about Labor Day, and so I can't let it go, because I wanted to have a chance to talk about what happened uh, a number of years ago, when love came to town in the city of Almalanga, Guatemala. And uh, what happened when the Lord's love came to town? And what the city was like before it encountered um, the powerful work of, of Christ and the missionaries that were there. So, I want to, I want to, I've asked Stephen to help me here, just to give you a little uh, frame of reference, because I had to look it up. There's a couple pictures of where Almalanga, Almalanga, I never said that correctly, Guatemala is located. And, um, and you're welcome to go on to the next one. So,
So in this city, there was a, a, it was under heavy demonic control with little future for any of its inhabitants. Do you know that Jesus cares about setting, and not just us as individuals free, but he wants to set whole cities free. And so they had very little future. Here's a state of the affairs of that town prior to the revival that, that broke out there. It was a very spiritually dark place. Poverty was widespread. Alcohol was controlling the population with 36 bars in a population of around 20,000. Food for families was sparse. And what little food, or what little money parents had was spent on alcohol. So you can see that there was a real addictive spirit that was hanging over this, this whole city. And along with it, domestic violence was very prevalent. And the streets were full of violence. And even with a relatively small population, there were four jails. And they were so crowded that they would overflow, and so the prisoners would have to be sent off to the neighboring city. Well, education, of course, you can see how it would be affected, because education was a, became of little importance. And another problem was that there were occult practices that were very widespread, and there was a public worship of idols. And the people in the community would often turn to occult practices and were worshiping a Mayan folk deity. And that deity went by the name of Maximum, the image um, that had been worshiped and revered by the people of the region for many, many centuries. So Maximum was nothing more than just a mask. It was a wooden mask, but it held such strong strongholds over the people and the whole territory. And they were bound to the custom of offering maximum God the, the, uh, of various sacrifices like money or cigarettes or cigars or liquor or corn and flowers. They had, were forced to pay homage to this thing. Well, so what happened when missionaries first came? Because evangelical Christians were, you have to understand, were in such a minority. And those who attempted to just uh, share, the, you know, share the gospel were met with sticks and rocks. They would literally chase them off. And if you converted to Christianity, the store owners wouldn't sell you food because you weren't paying tribute to the maximum. So, and then on top of it, some of these practicers of this occult um, craft would come in and disrupt church services. And some people would attend church service and they would actually conduct witchcraft rituals while there. Isn't that something? I wish I could tell you that, that uh, this is made up, but this is very true. Well, there's a pastor by the name of Mariano Riscaje, and he was a key leader in town and was once threatened by six men. Get this, this is what happened to this guy uh, of the pastors. <coughs> well, they, they broke out his front teeth and they forced the barrel of a gun down his throat. And then they, get this, they pulled the trigger of the gun three times. But when nothing happened, they were filled with fear. Could you imagine that? They were filled with fear, and they ran away. Well, experiencing God's salvation from the situation Pastor Mariano brought his small congregation together <coughs> to begin interceding for the community so they could break the cycle of superstition, <coughs> evil, and poverty. I'm sorry. 
Can you just pray for me and my voice? Can we just do that? Yeah, would you, would you offer a little prayer? Thank you, Lord. Come in with your plan. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. I find it interesting that as soon as I start talking about this stuff, that all of a sudden it's hard to get words out. I've got to tell you, we don't put up with that here. So, I told you that, that those guys ran away. So experiencing God's salvation from that situation, Pastor Mariano brought his small congregation together to begin interceding for the community so that they could break the cycle of superstition, evil, and poverty. So isn't that interesting? It wasn't just God here to save our church. It was specifically break poverty, break addiction, break the connection to these uh, demonic forces. And as Pastor Mariano's congregation made a, a commitment to prayer, remember we, um, Jim has had us praying a particular prayer as we gather together, as we think about apostles. I think that's so key, prayer. So in that, they sensed that the Holy Spirit had given them the gift of faith to believe. And that what they were praying would come to pass, that they, they would see it occur. And so they were encouraged and excited by this new gift. These intercessors began to fast three to four days per week, fasting and prayer. And every Saturday they assembled for united prayer. So, you want to know what happened? Oh, yeah, you can flip this. I got caught up. I'm not used to high tech. That's, that's, that's what they were living in. God bless them. Go ahead and flip it. So, here's what happened. After the heightened level of commitment to prayer was made, idolaters in the community began placing their faith in Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Yes. And as a result, these folks began attending church. And just like in a Bible, when the power of God was manifested, it opened people's eyes to the truth. And then the churches began to grow. And there were many signs and wonders openly demonstrated, including mass deliverances where um, and they were delivered from demonic oppression. The casting out of demons, which was so much a part of Jesus' ministry, not only brought freedom to individuals, but the spiritual oppression that was over the church literally began to lift. Do you see what I mean about how God can break strongholds over entire regions in such a way that it changes and transforms the spiritual atmosphere. Do you believe the Lord would see the spiritual atmosphere? Now the capitalist means ten cities, but I heard that there's like seven cities. Is like seven cities in Hampton Roads? What would happen if we began to pray and fast and suddenly gun violence and domestic abuse and those things started to break and be canceled and addiction started and homelessness started to be canceled. I mean, that, this, is, this is powerful stuff because you know what? If it can happen in, in um, Amalanga, Guatemala, why can't it happen in Hampton Road? 
So the, the spiritual atmosphere began to change. So Pastor Mariano Riscai said that for revival to come, the enemy had to be confronted directly and boldly. And if you go to the scripture, Jesus, every time Jesus dealt with the forces of the demonic, he was never passive about it. He confronted those forces of evil directly and succinctly. He wasn't casual about it. He didn't just put it off. He was very direct. And I believe that's the answer as well. So what else happened? Here's some things that happened. Maximum's priests began to be converted. Could you imagine that? A gentleman by the name of Jose uh, Bino Taye was one of the most influential shamans associated with Maximum. And he was often sought out by the people in the community for his occult powers, for healing and blessing. And the day after he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ, he and his family burned all of their idols and their witchcraft paraphernalia. Amen? Seeing that shaman's conversion impassioned the believers to enhance their prayers for the entire community. Isn't that a, that's a huge breakthrough, isn't it? So, this is where I find it neat and because it really does connect to Labor Day. Because what these people had experienced in the chronic alcoholism and everything that they, they had faced, it, was, it destroyed their work ethic. Nothing was getting done. So for many years, the land around Almolongo, Ma'almolonga, which was, which was uh, uh, being farmed and, and everything by the people, it had become very dry and arid. And this hindered work production and the prosperity of the community. Do you see how revival even affects the ground and the soil? I mean, we have so many folks who are, you know, and I'm, I'm not against godly stewardship of the earth. But there's a difference between godly stewardship of the earth and worshiping the earth. Amen? Okay, two of you agree. That's good. <clears throat> So, but this, because of the, the chronic problems that they faced, it hindered work production and the prosperity of the community. And the poor or work ethic among the people also had a very detrimental effect upon the food production. But after the revival, the, because the people, alcoholism was being broken off of them and the addiction and and various other issues they had, as they're working, the ground, the land actually became much more fertile. Because if the ground isn't worked, it, it goes into a state where it becomes less fertile. But if you're working the ground, the ground has got to be worked. It's got to be cared for. It's got to have a harvest and, and be churned up. Some of you are, are into gardens and stuff. You know a lot better than I do. But after a year in revival, the literal ground becomes became so much more fertile. Listen to this. Prior to the revival, farmers were exporting four trucks of produce per month. Four trucks of produce per month. But following revival, there were 40 trucks exporting food every week with vegetables being sold in El Salvador, Mexico, and all throughout Guatemala. It became like the 
produce became literally, literally in biblical proportions because of the blessing and because Jesus came to town and set people free. There's records that you can, you can see of a gentleman holding a carrot literally the size of a man's arm and round as well. Could you imagine that? That sounds like biblical proportions. Now, I know that there's some scoffers and disbelievers. I know that even BBC went over to interview them. And they, they had different theories on, on things and, and everything. But the point is not the giant size of the carrots or any of the rest of the produce. It's the difference that God made in coming to town and setting them free from the occult and from the chains of addiction. So here's a few things that were undeniable miracles that occurred in Amalanga. A number, and this is trans, it, it's just fascinating, the transformation. A number, the number of churches in the town of 20,000 grew to over 24, with several churches having regular attendance over a thousand. Eight out of ten residents considered themselves born-again Christians. The pastor, the church pastored by Mariana Riscate, which seats 1,200, was almost full every single Sunday. Names of businesses, this is cool, Names of businesses and street names were changed, taking on biblical names. 36 bars that were operating prior to the arrival were reduced to only three, with many of them being turned into churches. As the drinking was reduced, so was the violence. As of 1989, the last of Amalanga's four jails was closed and was renovated, becoming the location for community events, weddings, and receptions. Can you imagine that? The community now has two Christian radio stations, and this is some time ago, so there's probably more. Idolatry and superstition were displaced by fervent worship of God. The priests who used to care for the idol, Maximon, what happened to them? They moved their worship elsewhere in other towns. Christian values dominated the people's work ethics. They came into a new value of work. You get this one. The town brothel was converted into a pregnancy counseling center. The divorce rate dropped to zero. Literacy levels greatly increased. And I want to share something because I thought this was really huge, so listen up. Prior to the revival, women were considered not much different than servants. And after the revival, women became began to become educated, they started businesses, and even stepped into professions previously considered only for men. How about that, ladies? The churches continued their same level of fervency and fasting and prayer, claiming that fasting gives them power over the principalities of darkness. Amalanga became one of the cleanest and most prosperous towns in all of Guatemala. So the, the scripture is very explicit about the effect, of the impact of what happens when the gospel is introduced to a city and a region and a culture and how it even affects language. And I love the fact that when Jesus says that word in this passage that we heard in the gospel, 
to open to open his tongue, open the hearing of, of that man. He says it in the language that of that town, of that region. He says, Epitha, be open. And it's a language that the people understand, but the region understands, and the culture understands. So it's something to consider because while we might be saying a great prayer, which is God save our church. What about God save our city? God set people free. Break the chains of addiction. What if in our prayer and our fasting and a stirring in this new school year and kind of a new year in the church cycle, that in fasting and prayer and prayer groups, that we started to track and we prayed for specific areas over Hampton Roads that are specifically known for gun violence or those that are, are known for gang activity or those that are known for, for alcohol or substance abuse or prone to violence in particular areas. And we targeted those areas and we started praying and fasting. And we sought God's face with all of our hearts. And we started to track it. And we started to see those numbers begin to change. What's the difference? I know that sometimes the thing that hampers us the most is we're good with what, you know, it's a good place. It's a good place. This is a good place. Amen? Chest Beach, great place. It's a good place. You've got a lot going on. It's right. It's a lot of good. But you know what the enemy of good is? Great. What's best? I want to see this city made a different place because of the prayers and the fasting. This place. Yeah. Put up for the adventure. Okay, so Lord, thank you so much. Your word is life. Have a thought. Be open. Have your way, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Notice how that prayer worked. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. 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 Let's share in that peace.